All right then, let's start solving some problems. Here's one example. So when striking, the pike, a predatory fish, can accelerate from rest to a speed of four meter per second in 0.11 second. What is the acceleration of the pike during the strike? And how far does the pike move during the strike? Now, the first step will be to uh, identify what type of problem is this? Uniform motion or non-uniform motion? Because remember, if it's a uniform motion, then you have basically one equation. X final equals X initial plus VX times time. Just that equation. If it's a non-uniform motion, then you have then other, you know, four, you know, uh, four kinematic equations, right? That are, you know, just like I showed you. That means here we can say that, um, okay, so two, three, and four. So V final equals V initial plus AX times time. X final equals X initial plus V initial T plus one half AT square. The subscript X just means it's a horizontal. So, but this is just gonna be horizontal no matter what. That means remember everything is horizontal or everything just vertical in this chapter. V final, equal, v final square equals V initial square plus two times acceleration times delta X and delta X equals V initial plus V final divided by two times time. That means you have to recognize if it's uniform motion where you have just this equation or non-uniform motion where you have all of those equations. So the indication here, this acceleration is zero for this case and acceleration is constant for this one. So in this problem, we are told that we are accelerating. So that means it's a non-uniform motion. So we go ahead and, you know, choose this set. Okay. So, and then what we're going to do here is, all right, so we do recognize, so it's a non-uniform motion. So let's get rid of this because it's important to do this, to make a table of given information. So let's say you can say, all right, so what I'm given here is this. I'm told that when striking, the, the fish can accelerate from rest to a speed of four meter per second in 0.11 second. From rest means your initial velocity is zero. To a speed of four meter per second means final speed, right? This four meters per second. The time interval then 0.11 second where you take initial time to be basically zero. So we can also take the initial position as zero when the fish starts moving. So what we need to then find for part A here is what is the acceleration? And for part B here is what is basically X final, right? Then you look at those four equations and try to see which one you can use to solve the problem. Assuming that you also understand, let's say what we're not given. For part A, acceleration, what can you use to find acceleration? You look at your equation. Here's acceleration in equation one. Here's acceleration in equation two. Here's acceleration in equation three. Remember, you want to use equation where only acceleration is the unknown, everything else you are given. Equation three, for example, it wants V final, which we have, V initial, which we have, and delta X in order to solve acceleration but we don't have delta X because we don't have X final. So equation three is useless for us. So we go ahead and forget about equation three. That means you cannot use equation three right now to solve for acceleration. Equation two then has X final, another unknown along with acceleration. That means again, we cannot use this. So you're gonna again, ignore this equation for solving for the uh, X final, uh, the acceleration. That means it leaves acceleration in equation one, which V final equals V initial plus AX times T. Well, clearly we have all of the other ones except acceleration. So we go ahead and say, okay, part one, we can say V final equals V initial plus A times T. This is equal to just A times T because V initial here is zero. That's how I indicate that something is zero. So like, let's say an arrow indicating this term is zero. That means what you have is this V final is equals to AT. 
for A is equals to B final over T. So it's four meter per second over 0.11 second. And I solve for the acceleration, which is 36 meter per second. Sorry, second square. That's for the acceleration from part A. All right, so how about part B, which is asking for the how far means, you know, final position. That means one thing I have for part B is now I have acceleration as well, which is 36 meter per second square. That means the only thing here I don't have is the X final. And I go and look at which equation I have for X final, which is here one equation for X final. And here's another, remember delta X is basically X final minus X initial, taking X initial to be zero, I can technically solve for that. And I have anything that everything that I want, including here that I can solve for the X final. That means I have one, two and three equations. All of them gives me X final and I can use all of those equations. And then you choose which one is the easiest one, right? So to me, the easiest one is equation four. Because what I do here is I do that, you know, remember delta X is X final minus X initial, which is zero. Technically it's X final equals V initial. Well, V initial is zero plus V final, which is four divided by two, then times time, which is 0.11 second, which is four over two, two times 0.11. Then X final here is equals to 0.22 meters. That's it, I'm done. Same way I could have used equation two where it says X final equals X initial, which is zero plus V initial times time. Well, the initial is also zero, so plus zero. Then plus one half acceleration times time square. Well, acceleration is 36. Time is 0.1, well, I'm out of room. Let me do it like this. Since those things are zero, so it becomes one half AT square. So then one half times 36 times 0.11 square. Again, I'm gonna get 0.22 meters, same thing, right? That means you have two ways you can basically solve this problem uh, for this part B, right? Um, and even, you know, equation three can also give you that, but it's even, you know, more complicated than, you know, try to see which one is the easiest when you have more than one option. Here's another example. How long does it take a car to cross a 30, mile, 30 meter wide intersection after the light turns green, if the car accelerates from rest at a constant two meter per second square acceleration. Again, your first thing would be to identify uniform versus non-uniform. And again, it asks you to accelerate, to find the acceleration, clearly it's uniform. Eh, sorry, non-uniform. Clearly this is non-uniform. So then you make the table to write down what you have. It says it's a 30 meter wide intersection that means I can take the X initial to be zero and X final to be 30 meters, which then makes my you know, intersection 30 meter wide. Also, I'm told that uh, I start from rest, which means another initial velocity to be zero. And I have my acceleration to be two meter per second square. What I wanna find here is how long does it take for us, for these cars to go you know, through that 30 meter a wide intersection, which is finding time. All right, so again, you write down your equations and then you see which one allows you to solve for that. Now you're given final, you know, uh, initial position, final position, initial velocity and acceleration and see which equation that can give you the T. All right, so equation one, V final equals V initial plus AT. All right, so there's a time over there. And this is the easiest equation. The question is, can I use it? Well, no, because you have two unknowns, time and V final. So I can't use this. Equation two, X final equals X initial plus V initial time plus one half AT squared. Can I use this? How many unknown do I have? Well, I have this, I have this, I have this, I have acceleration. Well, the only thing I don't have is the time. That means it's a good equation to use. And that's what we're gonna do. So X final equals X initial is zero. V initial is zero, so this entire term, term is zero. Then plus one half AT squared, which means X final 
equals one half times acceleration times time square. We switch the sides. One half times acceleration times square equals x final. Then I rearrange and solve for the t. See then t squared is equals two. So multiply both sides by two and divide both sides by acceleration. And then since t squared is t squared, then we also take the square root of both sides. That means t is equals to square root of two times 30 meters and divided by two meter per second square. I calculate this, we're gonna get 5.5 seconds. And that's basically how long it will take for the car to go from zero to 30 meter you know, in intersection. All right, here's one more example. A speedboat moving at 30 meter per second approaches a marker 100 meter ahead. The pilot slows the boat with a constant acceleration of negative 3.5 meter per second square by reducing the throttle. How long does it take the boat to reach the buoy? What is the velocity of the boat when it reaches the marker? Right, so the buoy and the marker is basically the same thing, right? So the marker is where the buoy. That means what we have here is we have a car that is basically now slowing down because what I have here is if I look at the, what's given to me, by the way, you can kind of make a picture, rough picture too. So let's say here's the boat, I don't know, make a boat or remember the particle. So you can make it just particle. And you can say, all right, so this particle initially moving with the 30 meter per second velocity. But then you're also told there is an acceleration of negative 3.5 meter per second square. Remember, velocity, acceleration, opposite signs, you slow down. All right, so this is x initial, which we can set to zero. And this is x final, which is technically, we don't know what it is. So, uh, Never mind, 100 meters. So this is 100 meters. That means you can do like a rough picture and then write down here, the initial equals 30 meters per second, acceleration negative 3.5 meter per second square, x initial zero, and then x final here is 100 meters. So then what we wanna find is part A, how long does it take the boat to reach the buoy? So we wanna find the time. And what is the velocity of the boat when it reaches that point? That means V final. That means what is the V final here when it reaches this marker here? So what is V final? That means the time and V final. All right, so that means two things. All right, so let's look at what we have. Remember our equations. One, V final equals V initial plus AT. Can I use this equation to find the time? How long? Well, there's a time, but see, I don't know, I don't have the V final also. So I can't use this equation to find part A. About equation two, uh, which goes like this, X final equals X initial plus V initial T plus one half A T square. All right, so X final, X initial given, V initial given, acceleration given, the only unknown is time. That means that's it, I can use this. Because other equation with time was four, which is then delta x equals v final plus v initial over two times time. Again, I couldn't use the time here because I also don't have v final. So that means equation two it is. So then we go and write, all right, part A, x final equals x initial plus v initial times plus one half a t squared. All right, so at least one thing we have here is this x initial here is zero. But nothing else is zero. Now what I have here is this. This is one time where I can actually, you know, plug in values so you can see one thing. So this is 30, oh sorry, this is 100. Then this is equals to the initial is 30 times t, then minus one half, well, let me do this, plus negative 3.5 times t squared. This is my equation. So what I end up here is this, if I kind of rearrange this, so this will end up this, 30t minus um, 
half of 3.5 is what is it 1.75 so minus 1.75 t squared so if I put this around and rearrange it I get this 1.75 t squared minus 30 t plus 100 move everything to the left then equals zero the reason I'm doing this because I have a term with t square, another term with t, another term which is constant. That means the only way here I can solve for t square uh, for, for time is if I use quadratic equation, right? So try to understand that, you know, sometimes you would need to use quadratic equation. There is nothing wrong with that. Remember, quadratic equation is this. t is equals to negative b plus minus then square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. All right, so remember, what we have here is our b is negative, you know, here b is negative 30, a is 1.75, and c is 100. All right, so using that, so I have negative, negative 30, plus minus, then square root of, 30 squared is 900, then minus four times 1.75 times 100. Then this is divided by two times 1.75. Right, so if I do this, here's what I get. T is equals to 12.6 seconds and then 4.53 seconds, which is generally happens very rarely. Usually one of the numbers is negative. So then you can know that time can never be negative. So you just ignore that and just take the one that is positive. But here you have two numbers that are not negative. The question is, which one is the correct one? And both of them, uh, you know, only one of them in this case is the correct one. So which one is the correct one? And this is where you kind of, you know, improvise. You kind of like figure out what's going on. So let's say if you have 30 meter per second speed, which means every second you cover 30 seconds. Sorry, every second you cover 30 meters. Even though you are slowing down by this rate, that means, see, at t equals zero, your speed is 30 meters per second. So the first second you cover 30 meters. So you're here, 30 meters. What, at that instant, your velocity now decreased by that much. That means it's 26.5 meters per second. That means one second later, your, your distance is 30 meters plus that, which is 56.5 meters. So you already two, only two seconds has passed and you already covered more than half. So what do you think? Will it take another, you know, let's say 10 seconds to get to the 100 meters or another maybe two seconds to get to, get to the 100 meters or a little bit, too, a little bit you know, over two seconds. And it will be obvious, right? It's gonna be this because uh, the, you know, the next one will be maybe or somewhere over here, which is maybe seven, 70 something meters. And then the last one, which will be 100 meters plus, you know, a little bit that. That means you just try to see if which one makes sense. And in this case, this guy makes sense because there is no way you are moving 12, 12 seconds when you start with that speed. Because your acceleration is very, very small. That means your speed decreases at a low rate. So you're still moving on average 20 or 30 meters per second. So 100 meters, you should cover like a little over four seconds. How about part B? What is the velocity of the boat when it reaches the marker? Well, this is again, you look at all the equations, see which one can give you X, you know, V final. If you now have time, acceleration, and V initial. And in this case, the going back to this equation one, for part B, this is the perfect equation because V final equals V initial plus AT. So this gives you 30 meters per second plus negative 3.5 meter per second squared times time, which is 4.53 and calculate the velocity, which is 14.1 meter per second. And that's your final velocity by the time you get reached that 100 marker. All right, so that means, you know, you can expect sometimes to be able to, you know, use quadratic equation to find the time. Whenever you have a term, 
So technically, when you're using equation two, and an initial velocity is not zero. If you're lacking an initial velocity is zero, then you end up canceling the time. So then you have just one, you know, one t, and you can just use the you know, square root. But if the initial velocity term, you know, non-zero, and acceleration term is non-zero, then you have another one term with t squared, another term with t, and you end up with quadratic equation. All right. So this is just shows in terms of the graph for the position versus time when you have an, you know, a constant acceleration. This is a non-uniform motion. So, so basically this is a non-uniform motion with A as constant acceleration. It's constant acceleration. So your position versus time graph will be curved like that and your velocity versus time will be a you know, straight line like that, linear increase. Okay. And this one just gives you kind of like, let's say what type of relationship to expect, right? So there are linear, quadratic, inverse, inverse square proportions between the two variables. And this is something we're gonna be doing in the lab quite a lot. So things like this, this is what we call linear relationship. When you have a straight line like that, that means you have two, two quantities on the y axis and the x axis and they are related as y equals basically mx, right? This is basically linear relationship. And then here is a quadratic equation, right? So basically your graph kind of looks like this, where y is equals to maybe like, let's say some constant times x squared, or you can say this proportional to x squared. This is when y proportional to one over x, that means it's a decrease, right? So it's kind of like decreasing one over x. When x is one, it's one over one. When x is two, it's one over two. When x is three, it's one over three. You can say, right, as x increases, y actually decreases. Or y can decrease even more if you have a y proportional to one over x squared rather than one over x, because it's much bigger, you know, decrease for y. All right, so now we are down to our last, you know, uh, example of a, uni a non-uniform motion with constant acceleration. But this one is specific in such a way that here is a motion where the motion is determined by Earth's gravity. Okay, so Earth has effect on every object around it, closer to the surface, and all the object, you know, obviously take something, hold it, and let go, it falls down. Well, that's, you know, Earth gravity, you know, affecting the object. And when Earth's gravity is the only thing affecting the object, that motion is known as a free fall. So the free fall is motion of the object due to the effect of gravity. Galileo, in about 500 years ago, was able to figure out that when objects actually moving due to Earth's gravity, they are not just moving, let's say, at constant rate, they're actually speeding up. They're accelerating, which means that if you start, if you holding an object and you drop it, well, technically you start from initial velocity equals zero, right? If you're dropping it because it starts from zero. Then he was able to find the rate at which the velocity would change. What is the velocity one second later? Well, he learned that it's 9.8 meter per second, negative because it's, you know, straight down. Another one second, the velocity is then 19.6 19 meter per second. All right, again, negative because it's down. How about the next second? Well, it's negative 29.4 meter per second. That means every second it increases, but it increases by exactly the same amount, by exactly 9.8 meter per second each second. So he was able to figure out that acceleration due to gravity is equals to 9.8 meter per second squared. And since it's a vector, negative then indicates the direction, right? That means acceleration due to gravity, which basically the effect that Earth has on object is constant and it doesn't change. Any object accelerates due to gravity by exactly same rate. 9.8 meter per second square and in a negative direction, which is toward Earth, okay? So he was able to show that, for example, any two object can technically have the same acceleration. So if you drop two objects, they should go and hit the ground together at the same time. So if you take two rocks, you drop it, 
most likely they hit the ground at the same time. You take a rock and a feather, you drop it, obviously they don't hit the ground at the same time. Now, the question is that, is that Galileo wrong? No, Galileo is still correct. But the idea here is when you're dropping a rock and a feather, there are other things into play, like say air resistance, air molecules affecting the motion of those objects. Rock is a heavy and compact object. It pushes all air, air, air molecules and it goes straight, straight down. Feather doesn't have that luxury. It's more, there's more surface and it's lighter. So air resistance affects it more. If there is no air in, in let's say in, in, a, in your laboratory, for example, if you do an experiment in a vacuum, you can actually have both of them hit the ground. And that's what we have. See a feather and a hummer falling on the moon during the Apollo 15 mission by astronaut Dave Scott, they hit the ground at the same time. Why? Because there's no air in, in, on the moon. So air resistance is absent. Any two objects hit the ground at exactly the same time. That means Galileo's, you know, you can see, right? Galileo was correct, but you have to understand that this is gonna be true only if there is no air resistance. And that's one thing we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be assuming that every time we're dealing with the free fall problems, then we have kind of this scenario where you drop apple and the feather, they're gonna hit the ground exactly the same time. And both of them gonna have acceleration of negative 9.8 meter per second square. And that's the only thing. So all the air resistance will be negligible or, you know, non-existent. Well, there is no such thing as non-existent. So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna say it's negligible. So we're gonna ignore it. And obviously it's a simplification, but this is what we're gonna be doing. All right, so that means in absence of air resistance, any object will have this acceleration. This number is constant. So what we do, we give it, you know, we'll use this lowercase g to represent that. So we're gonna say that lowercase g, which is acceleration due to gravity, is 9.8 meter per second square. And this is basically constant. That means that we're gonna say acceleration, which always gonna be in a vertical direction, equals negative g, because g is 9.8 meter per second square. Both of them are vectors. Negative just represents in which direction it's acting, which is straight down. All right, so let's look at then examples. For example, an African antelope known as a spring bug will occasionally jump straight up into the air, a movement known as a prank. The speed when leaving the ground can be as high as seven meters per second. Now, if a spring bug leaves the ground at seven meters per second, how much time will it take for it to reach the highest point? How, how long will it stay in the air? And when it returns to earth, how fast will it be moving? All right, so let's see what we are given here. And how do we know it's a free fall problem? Well, think like this, as soon as the antelope jumps, its entire motion then affected by gravity. That's why right now, if you try to jump, you're not gonna continue jumping up, right? So you're not gonna just basically speed up upward. What you're gonna do, you're gonna slow down. Why are things slowing down when they, you know, jumping? Well, because of the same thing I mentioned before. So imagine this is the antelope. It jumps up with initial velocity in a y direction, so let's say. But remember, in which direction the gravity is acting? Well, the gravity always, always acting straight down. It's a vertical acceleration and it's negative g, okay? Which means velocity as a vector and acceleration as a vector have opposite signs. So what happens if object is moving in one direction but acceleration in the opposite direction? Remember, you slow down. That means antelope gonna straight jump but then it's gonna slow down, slow down, slow down until it reaches the maximum position, which is basically highest point. The highest point is how high it will go until it stops and you know starts falling down. That means what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna say that ground is where the antelope starts. This is gonna be point A. Point B is gonna be the highest point is gonna reach, which is the maximum height. Like MH, I'm gonna use maximum height. That means y position of b is the maximum height or the highest point. And generally what happens here is this. That's the highest vertical position any object reaches if it's moving in free fall. So maximum height is the highest vertical position because at that position, any object that basically was jumping, right, 
gonna stop, that means the velocity at point B here is equals to zero, then it's gonna start falling down. Now, when it's falling, this is the direction of the velocity, which is, matches the direction of acceleration, so object actually speeds up as it's going down. And that's kind of what we have. But let's say right now for part A, it says, how much time will it take for it to reach its highest point? So let's see what we have. What I have here is I'm gonna say that position, so let's see what's given. And it, says, it seems like almost nothing is given. We're only given that you know it, it has a seven meter per second initial speed, that's it. But actually we, we have some information. We know that let's say the initial, and what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say my point A is my initial. So, and so this is basically my initial point, right? So VA is seven meters per second, positive seven meters per second. Now we're gonna jump from A to B, B being my highest point. Now I know one thing already, then B is being my final point, but it's also the highest point. Velocity there is zero. Again, every time when you jump, the highest point you reach, you're gonna stop before you're coming you know, down. That means velocity at the highest point is always zero. Well, I also have acceleration, which is equals to negative G. So technically I have those three things. And I can even say Y A here equals zero, which is my reference position. So let's see what I wanna find. I wanna find the time from A to B. Time from A to B. Okay, so let's, let's see what we can do. Here's equation one for kinematics. And the question is, can I use these kinematic equations? Of course you can, because your acceleration is constant. It doesn't change. So you technically can use all those kinematic equations. Now let's see what we have. Here's kinematic equation one. V final in the y direction equals V initial in the y direction plus acceleration in the y direction times time. That means I just change the subscript and this is still one dimensional motion, but along the y axis. Which means now I have this. I can technically rearrange this equation and change it where my acceleration in the y direction is replaced with negative g. I can just do that. I can say a y is equal to negative g, so this becomes negative gt, which is technically only true in free fall. Now let's see, can I use this equation to find time? Well, of course I can, because I know the final, which is basically my VB. I know the initial, which is VA, and minus GT. I know because I have all of those except time, so I can use this equation. So I can rearrange this, where GT is equals to, you know, uh, VA minus VB, basically rearranging in such a way that, you know, let's say, you know, um, move the gt to the left side move vb to the right side and then divide both sides by t sorry by g actually to find t then t is equals to va which is seven meter per second minus vb which is zero divided by 9.8 meter per second square i calculate this i'm going to get 0 0.71 second so that's the time it takes for it to go from A to B. Let's look at part B. This was part A. Part B then says, how long will it stay in the air? All right, so let's see what I have. Staying in the air means that going from A to B and then coming back down to point, let's call this C, which is the ground again, hitting the ground again. That means I wanna look at the time it takes for the entire motion going from A to C. So now let's see what I have. I need to then look at which equation can give me that. Again, I, if you go through the kinematic equations, which I recommend you guys put it in some kind of three by five note card. Remember, you can use those note cards for the qu quizzes, right? So then you can see then in this particular case, I can you know technically use this equation too, where my final position, let's call this now, mo now we're moving from A to C. So my final position is YC. My initial position is YA then plus my initial velocity, which is A times time, then plus one half vertical acceleration times T square. Okay, so let's see what I have. I'm gonna do this. I'm actually gonna go ahead and use this 
where I replace ay with negative g. So I have you this equation because if I have a, if I have a free fall equation two modifies into this, then I want to look at it. Okay, so what is position c? Well, position c is also ground, which means it's also zero. So what I have is then this zero equals zero plus v a times time minus one half g t square. It simplifies to this. Let's move one half g t square to the left. I end up with one half g t square equals then v a times time. Well, we really like it because this is not a quadratic equation because here I can cancel this time with that. And what we end up with is this. Solving for t means I move one half g to the, to the right. So that means t is equals to two times v a over g. All right, so what am I getting? I'm getting 1.42 seconds, roughly. That's the time it takes to go from A to C. Now let's compare one thing. This is the time from A to B. This is the time from A to C. Do you see the, you know, how are they related? Well, the time it takes to go from A to B is exactly half of the time it takes to go from A to C, which is the entire thing. That means how long it takes to go from A to B is half of the total time. That means time to the maximum height is always gonna be half of the total time. But this is only if I'm going back to the same starting position. See, if I start from A, go and come back to the same point, same point as A, then my time is exactly the half to the highest point. If I come back, let's say my point C was somewhere over there, that this will not be true. But if I, you know, start from here, go and come back to that position, how long does it take the total, the, the total time that I have, right? The total time is always gonna be the double what I, what I would have to the highest point, okay? So that's kind of what we will have. All right, so now, this is basically for part B. Now let's look at part C. Part C says, when it returns to Earth, how fast, will it be moving? All right, so let me kind of get rid of this so I have more room for part C. Here's what I'm gonna have for part C. I wanna know basically how fast it's moving when it reaches point C. That means I'm gonna look at motion from A to C. And to do that, remember, I know how fast I'm moving at A. I know how long does it take to go from A to C, which I just calculated. And I know the acceleration, which is negative G. That means I can use equation one where final velocity, which is velocity at C, equals initial velocity, which is velocity at A, then plus acceleration times time. But remember, I'm using this version of that, which is minus G times T, and this is the total time. So that means what I'm gonna get, VC is equals to VA is seven meter per second, minus then 9.8 times 1.42 seconds, and here's the thing, if I calculate, I'm getting roughly negative seven meter per second. That's my final speed when I get reach the point C. So let's see what we have. Remember, the last velocity at A when I jumped up was seven meter per second, but up. So velocity when I come back down, which is point C, which is same as point A technically, is now again seven meter per second, but down, which means now it's also there's a symmetry there how fast you jump up, if you come back to the same position on your way down, you're hitting the ground with the same speed as the, your jumping speed. And remember, when you come back and hit the ground, never say your speed is zero, because we're not talking about when you hit the ground and you stop. We're talking about impact speed. So it says when it returns to earth, how fast will it be moving? It's never zero because you know, you're not hitting the ground with zero velocity. Because it means that right before you come back, you stop. No you hit the ground with some speed, right? Imagine if there's something on the ground, you will break it if you hit it with some impact speed. That means velocity when you come back and hit the ground, never zero. And if your initial point and your final point exactly the same, you actually come back with the same velocity, but in opposite, or same speed, but in opposite direction, all right? All right, so let's look at one more example. Here we have a Spud Webb, which has a height of 5'7", was one of the shortest basketball players. So 
in, in, in the NBA. But he had an impressive vertical leap. He was repeatedly able to jump 1.1 centimeter off the ground. Well, it's actually quite a lot, it's 1.1 meters. So to jump, to jump this high, with what speed would he leave the ground? So basically what should be, you know, SpotWeb's initial velocity, right? So let's do this. Then let's look at what we have. Remember, what we do here is we make a table given, and you can even make a, you know, a rough picture. So here's point A, you know, this is velocity at point A, and then what we want, we know that it goes jumps all the way to this, you know, point B, right? Now, one thing we have, we have is this, take A position to be zero, position of B here is 1.1 meters. We're actually given that position. All right, so what else are, are we given? Uh, seems like not much, but remember point B is technically the highest point. That means there is no velocity there. VB is zero at that point. We also know that this is a free fall, so AY equals negative G. That's already a lot of information. And what do we want to find? Well, we want to find velocity at point A, which is initial velocity. Well, given all of those things, you can see, right? You want to find initial velocity, but you're not given time, one, one important thing, but you're given displacement, you're given final velocity and acceleration. So you go through the list of kinematic equations, you eliminate equation one, because we're not given time. Equation two, uh, you eliminate equation two because uh, equation two requires time again. So go to equation three. Well, you look at equation three, which is like this, final velocity, which is B squared, equals initial velocity, A squared, then plus two times acceleration times delta Y. Replace AY with negative G. And then you can see that I have this guy, I have G, I have delta Y, and I have just one unknowns, that's all I need. That means equation three is the winner in this case, so we go ahead and do that. VB is zero, VA squared minus two G delta Y, we rearrange it, or VA is equals to two G delta Y, but since VA is squared, take the square root of both sides. That means VA is equals to square root of two times 9.8 meter per second square times 1.1 meters. And we're gonna calculate the you know, initial velocity, right, of the player to be 4.6 meter per second. There we go. That's how you approach this problem, right? Again, even equation four, we could, have, we could not have used because we, again, don't have time. The only time independent equation is VA. All right. Okay, so here's one last example, which kind of, again, summarizes some of the things we talked about. So a stone thrown from the top of a building is given initial velocity of 20 meter per second straight upward. The stone is launched 50 meter above the ground and stone just misses the edge of the roof and it's on its way down. So this is technically a one dimensional free fall. Go straight up, straight down. Okay, again, how do we know it's a one dimensional? Straight upward, all right? So anything straight up or straight down or you just drop something, that's a one dimensional free fall. All right, so we designate some points. Point A is gonna be our starting point. And here's what I have. This is gonna be at initial time t equals zero, position A is zero, velocity at A is 20 meter per second, and acceleration is negative nine point meter per second squared down, okay? Then we go to point B. All right, so now, in terms of what we have is this. Ah, sorry. So again, I think I'm missing the questions here, but let's say here's you know, uh, part A. Part A is asking, um, taking the TA equals zero as the time the stone leaves the thrower's hand at position A, determine the time at which the stone reaches its maximum height. What is my maximum height? Point B. What do we know about point B? There is no velocity at point B. So let's say right now, uh, we're only, we're not given any of this information. I'll open it in a minute. But I, we know these two things for sure. That velocity at B equals zero, and acceleration is negative 9.8. Now the question is, how come the acceleration at point A is negative 9.8 and at point B is at negative 
Well, that's because acceleration is negative 9.8 everywhere. Everywhere, because this is due to the fact that the Earth is here. And as long as you're like very close to the surface of Earth, and this is very close, I'm talking about, let's say, you know, if you go above our atmosphere or something like that, then you might still, you know, you might have a little bit of lower effect, but you're always gonna have the Earth's effect. And everywhere, no matter where you are, the acceleration is negative 9.8. Even where I'm sitting right now on my chair, right? The acceleration due to gravity on me right now is negative 9.8 meter per second square. But I'm not moving, what's going on? Well, because not only gravity is acting on me right now, but also other things. But if only gravity was acting on me, then I would have been accelerating straight down. So that's kind of like the idea. All right, so we are given this, that the stone is launched 50 meters above the ground, right? Which means we take the ground actually to be not, 50 me uh, not zero, and where we start is 50 meters, but we take the point A as zero, and ground, right? Like let's say, which is position E, right? To be negative 50 meters. Because what we do generally is whatever we start somewhere, right? Whatever our starting point is, launch point, we take that to be zero. So then if something is below that is negative as a position, something above that is positive as a position. All right, so let's see then what we have. We know that anyway. So let's say for part A, we're given YA equals zero. Y B is right now is unknown, but we know that V A here is 30 meters per sec, uh, sorry, 20 meters per second. I know that V B here is zero, and then A Y everywhere is negative G. So if I wanna know the time it takes to go from A to B, so what is let's say time going from A to B, then I can use equation one, kinematic equation one, where V final, V final, which is V B, equals V initial VA minus GT. Then from here, I rearrange where time is equals to VA minus VB over, over let's say the G, right? So this becomes basically, you know, 20 meter per second over 9.8 meter per second square. And I can calculate the time to be 2.04 seconds. Okay, so that's what I got. Part B is asking then, what will be the maximum height if you go from A to B? How high is point B is relative to A? Well, in this case then, what I have here is, I have A as zero position, B is right now what we're trying to calculate, but I still have VA is 20 meter per second, VB is zero, AY equals negative J, but now also the time it takes to go from A to B. So what I go here, what I do go and solve equation using equation two. YB is equals to YA plus VA times T, which is initial velocity times time, minus one half GT square. All right, so then what I do here is I just solve for YB because it's zero plus 20 meter per second times 2.04 seconds, then minus one half, 9.8, times 2.04 seconds squared. And YB is equals to 20.4 meters. That's how high the point B is relative to point A. All right. So then what I have here is the next will be, let's say for example, part C says, determine the velocity of the stone when it returns to the height from which it was thrown. Again, for example, I have a solution in the, in the slide where you can see that if you can calculate it, you will get as, remember, same speed, but in opposite direction because A and C are exactly same height, you know. But, you know, remember that one thing, right? If you start from here, let's say this is VA, and this is here point C, which is the same vertical height, then VA and VB will, sorry, VC will have the same velocities, but in opposite direction. That means VC will be negative 20 meter per second, right? You know, straight down. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, what we have for this, you know, for this example. All right, so the last I have uh, this example, which is you have a catapult, which launches a test racket vertically upward from a well, giving the racket an initial speed of 
80 meter per second at ground level. The engines then fire, right? So that means, you know, the, this is a rocket, so it had engines. The engines then fire and rocket accelerates upward at 40, uh, four meter per second square until it reaches an altitude of 1000 meters, All right? That means starting from here, right? Starting from here when it was given as initial, so let's call this point A. So initial velocity of 80 meter per second. So you give it, you know, initial velocity of 80 meter per second, but then as soon as it leaves the ground, right? Or the catapult, it starts accelerating upward. That means acceleration is not G. So here, what we have is acceleration AY is equals to four meter per second. That means it's, it's upward. That means it's gonna speed up. So it's gonna speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up until we get to this point B. And point B is where the engines fail, which you can see, right? So the engines then fire and the rocket accelerates upward at four meters per second square until it reaches the altitude of 1000 meters. At that point, its engines fail and the rocket then goes into free fall with an acceleration of negative 9.8 meters per second square. That means after point B, then it's a free fall. Now the question is, does it mean it's gonna start like falling down from point B? Well, it's a common mistake that a lot of students make, but no, because remember, it's been speeding up all the way to point B. That means at point B, it now has some kind of, you know, velocity. There's a VB not equals to zero because this is not a maximum height. So there is a VB, some final point. But from this point B, now it's a free fall. So it's gonna, you know, it has some kind of velocity, but then at that, after that, acceleration is negative G. So it's gonna go up, up, slow down, slow down until it stops at point C. Now C is now your maximum height. And from that, it's now gonna, you know, go down to let's say point D. That means from point A to point B, it's speeding up, upward. From point B to point C, it's slowing down as it goes upward. And then from C to D, it's speeding up as it's going downward, but you have two accelerations. So A1, which is four meter per second square, this is basically going from point A to point B only. Then after that, acceleration two is negative 9.8 meter per second square. This is basically after point B all the way to, you know, point D. That means from B to C, then back to D. That's why we have to break it down into two parts, okay? So first we wanna find part A, for what time interval is the rocket in motion above the ground? Okay, that means you want to know the total time going from, you know, A to B, B to C, C to D. One thing we can do here, we can actually like make now, you know, in, in my solution, I have numbers, zero, one, two, three, but it doesn't matter. One, two, three, or A to B, A, B, C, right? Same thing. So let's do this. That means we want to find the time it takes to go from A to B plus the time it takes to go from a, you know, from B to D, then just add those times together to get the total time. That's kind of like the idea. So let's do this. First, we look at from A to B. Because from A to B, I have this. I have velocity at A, which is 80 meter per second. I have acceleration one, which I call as one, right? Which is four meter per second square. But I have position of A is zero, but position of B as um, 1,000 meters, okay? That means this is everything I have for part, you know, from A to B. I wanna find the time, okay? So now, which equation can I use to find the time? Well, one thing I have here is this. For example, there are, you know, number of ways I can do that because I'm given initial velocity, I'm given, let's say the acceleration and thing like that. So if I do this equation, so going, you know, using equation two, for example, so YA equals YB, sorry, YB equals YA plus VA times time, then, you know, plus one half A1 times T square. So if I use this equation, I can solve for the time from A to B, but it's a quadratic equation, right? It's a quadratic equation. So we can do that. But let me show you another thing we can do. 
One thing I can do here is this. If you don't want to use quadratic equation, if you're scared of quadratic equation, here's what you can do. You can go and first find VB, how fast you're moving at point B. And I can use this equation, I can use equation three to do that. VB equals VA squared plus two times acceleration one times delta Y. Delta Y is from A to B. So if I do this, let's say square root, I can solve for VB. And let me show you why. So let's first solve for VB. So this is 80 square plus two times four, then times 1000 meters, let's say. Then I get VB as 120 meters. Why? Because it's speeding up upwards, right? By the time it gets to point B, it's moving faster. But now here's what I have. Going from A to B, I have VA, I have A1, and I have VB. That means I can go and just use first equation. VB equals VA plus A1 times T to just solve for time. That means, you know, I made it two steps. I have to find velocity first and then acceleration instead of just using equation one in one step. But equation one requires, you know, sorry, this equation, this, this version, right? This using equation two, you know, uh, by itself, right? It requires quadratic equation. So what I did, I first use equation three to find speed, velocity at B, then equation one to find the time. Because then time equals VB minus VA. And then divided by G, oh, sorry, divided by A1. So then I can use this, right? Where then T is equals to, and I'm gonna call this T1. Remember, this is just T for this segment. So 120 minus 80, over four, right? Which is the, the change in velocity divided by acceleration. And I'm gonna get um, 10 seconds because 120 minus 80 is 40, 40 over four is 10 seconds. That means what I get here is I get the time from A to B. The next would be to find time from B to D, all right? From B to D and that also I can do that. If I, for example, use this equation, uh, because I know, right, that YB is 1000 meters, YD here is zero. I know that now VB is equals to, velocity position B is equals to 120 meter per second. And for example, then I know that acceleration going from, uh, let, remember this is going from B all the way to D. And acceleration here, let's call this A2 is negative G. So for this one, I can also have two ways I can solve for that. For example, I can use equation two, where delta Y equals initial velocity So initial velocity, which is velocity at B times T, then minus one half, you know, G, right? One half G times T square. I can use this equation to solve for the time. So you can use this equation to solve for the time, or you can just basically do the same thing as I did over here. So first find velocity at let's say D and then rearrange and solve that. But in any case, see for example, if I use this equation, well, remember delta, delta Y is basically, in this case will be final, which is zero minus initial. So delta Y is negative 1000. Then this will be 120 T. Then this will be negative 4.9 T square. I use this equation to find the time. And at the time here, let's go back. So then time here, if I calculate, it will be 12.2 seconds. If you plug, plug in the quadratic equation, all right? Which means that I just add those two together, right? And I should then uh, find the time. Hold on, sorry. Uh, if I actually use this and find the time, I should get um, 31 seconds, sorry. Here I should get 31 seconds, okay. And the total time should be then 41 seconds. Because in my slides, I have slightly different ways. So I want to give you like two, two different ways to do that. All right. That means we get here 20 and uh, 41 seconds. 
And then after that, for example, part B, let's say, what is the maximum altitude? Then you can, you know, for example, calculate that using the information that you're given. Because one of the things we have here is for part B, you're then just looking at going from point B to point C. So we take the velocity at point B to be 180 or 120 meter per second. Acceleration is negative G and the time is 31 seconds. So then all I have to do is this, V final, which is V at C, sorry, D. We're going from C to uh, B to D, sorry guys. So velocity at point D equals initial velocity, which is velocity at, you know, at B. So let's say 120 meter per second. minus 9.8 times time from B to D, which we got here that to be 31 seconds. Then this will be negative 184 meters per second. And that's basically how fast the rocket will be going when it hits the ground. So the impact speed, all right? So the impact speed. Again, all this work I have on slides, on the lecture notes, so you guys can compare, look at it, and I'm, doing this a slightly different way. So you have kind of like, a, you know, uh, two different ways of approaching this problem. Again, there's always, you know, several ways to do every problem almost. So this is like basically what I do sometimes in my lectures, video lectures, I try to, you know, change a little bit. So you have kind of two different ways of looking at it. All right, so the very last thing we have in this chapter is relative velocity. And this relative velocity is what is the sort of like, let's say, velocity of one object relative to the other things. In this case, for example, imagine this. We have a train. And let's say the train moving with some velocity. But then what is the velocity of the train? So imagine if you're in the train, it seems like you know, the, 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 the train is not moving, right, for someone who's in the train. Because you're sitting there with the train, so you don't really feel like the train is moving. Let's say the train is moving at constant speed. But if you have a, if there's a cyclist outside of the train, right, in the platform, let's say, then for that, maybe you can say then the velocity is of the train is let's say 10 meter per second. Let's take it like that. So now what I have is this. So velocity of the train relative to the cyclist then is 10 meter per second. Because what I have, I'm giving you the velocity of the train relative to one specific, you know, uh, let's say absorber, which is the cyclist. But if you're talking about, for example, a person sitting in the train and the train is moving at constant speed, you actually don't feel like the train is moving. And relative to you, the train is not moving. So that's why velocity of the train relative to the cyclist. Because in reality, there is no such thing as absolute velocity. Velocity is relative, which means that every object can be, um, let's say as an observer, right, can measure different velocity. For example, right now I'm sitting in my house recording this, and let's say for someone else in my house, relative to them, I'm not moving, I'm just sitting. But technically I'm not sitting. I'm not at rest, only relative to that person I'm at rest because we all know that earth is moving and earth is moving means I'm moving. So for someone who's basically maybe in some kind of alien spaceship, right, looking at me, they will see me moving with earth with whatever velocity the earth has. So I am moving relative to them and they're moving relative to me. So that's why everything is relative. So right now, see, if you have a cyclist standing there you look at the train, train is moving at 10 meter per second to the right. If you're in the train, sitting in the train and looking outside at the cyclist, you will see that the cycle velocity of the cyclist relative to the train is negative 10 meter per second. Because if you're sitting in the train, it seems like the, you know, let's say the train is not moving, but the cyclist moving back 
at 10 meter per second. So that's, that's why relative velocity is basically, if, if I measure your velocity as 10 meter per second moving to the right, you will make, measure my velocity 10 meters moving to the left. Because you can say, well, you know what, I'm not moving, you're moving in the opposite direction. So that's kind of what we have. That's why velocities are relative. So then here's another thing I have. So let's say I have also a woman who's moving inside the train. So then what's the velocity of this woman inside the train? So think like this. So for somebody who's in your train, then let's say you can say that velocity of the woman relative to the train is five meter per second. Well, that's kind of a lot. So let's say two meters per second. So two meters per second. So the velocity of that woman relative to someone in the train is two meter per second because she's moving in the train at two meter per second. But the train is also moving at 10 meter per second relative to the cyclist. So then what will be the velocity of the woman relative to the cyclist? Well, you can probably use your intuition and guess that that's probably 12 meter per second. If you guess that, then you will be correct. Because if the woman is moving at two meter per second in the train, basically moving to the right, and the train is moving to the right at 10 meter per second, that woman moving to the right at 12 minutes per second relative to the cyclist, someone outside of the train. But the one thing that we're gonna do here is I'm gonna give you an equation where you guys can kind of see what, how things are. And this is generally takes into account three objects. So in this case, train, cyclist, and a woman. Right, so in this, how this, this is how it goes. So let's say you have object one, two, and three. So if I wanna find velocity, for example, of one relative to the, some, some other one, right? So let's say velocity of two relative to three. Okay, velocity of two relative to three will be like this. This will be equals to, then what you do here is this. It's always gonna be the sum of two velocities of two other things. So let's say this first subscript, subscript becomes the first subscript of the first one, first velocity. That means it will be velocity of two. Then the third one on the left side goes as a very last one, which will be here three. That means V two three equals V two relative to, to some, something else plus V something else relative to the three. And obviously since here I have two and three, that something else as you probably have guessed is one then it will be velocity of one, velocity of two relative to one, plus velocity of one relative to two, because those inner ones should match, all right? That means velocity of two relative to three equals velocity of two relative to one, plus velocity of one relative to three. Or for example, if I'm doing velocity of one relative to three, this will be velocity of, this goes here, one relative to something that is not here, which is two, plus velocity of, this one goes here, two relative to, this goes there, three. Now, so that's how the you know notation is. So for example, let's solve for this. We have what? We have cyclist, we have train, and we have the woman. So if I wanna find velocity of the woman relative to cyclist, it will be equals to velocity of, so this goes here, woman, relative to something that is not part of this combination, that this train, right? So velocity of the woman relative to train plus velocity of, then the cyclist goes to the last one, which will be then, this moves here, train relative to cyclist, right? So that's how it works. That means velocity of the woman relative to cyclist is equal to velocity of the woman relative to train plus velocity of the train relative to the cyclist. So that's why what we get is this. Velocity of the woman relative to train, two meter per second. Velocity of the train relative to the cyclist is 10 meter per second. So the total here is 12 meter per second. That means woman moving relative to the cyclist at 12 meter per second. All right, so that's it for this chapter.